I turned out to the um, how we are going to present. There are uh, five of us presenting the MEV drivers today. So I will present the um, ecosystem and then uh, there will be UEFI and the individual driver presentations. And the questions and answers would be at the end of this session. We are lack of time. The session organization is uh, you know Larry, he just introduced me and uh, I will be calling the um, NAV driver ecosystem, UEFI NAV drivers and the uh, time permits uh, Windows NAV reference driver and uh, then we have from Microsoft Mr. Lee Freud, he is the uh, man for the Windows drivers, uh, source of the Windows drivers basically. So then we have Parag from Seagate, the Linux and MIMI fabric drivers. Then we have Jim from Intel, uh, previous the MIMI driver and also the um, storage performance development kit, SPDK. He's going to talk about that. Then we have uh, Suzanne Sujay from VMware. So then we have the questions and answers. So NVM Express, as uh, you, know, you know, we have been beating this uh, session to death for the last three, four years. And, uh, it covers all the uh, major operating systems. We have Windows, we have the Linux, FreeBSD, VMware, Solaris, and uh, of course the platform form with the UEFI. Reference drivers are available, source code on the um, NVM Express website. There are contributions from the uh, NVM Express members. They are very passionate and a uh, lot of the folks uh, contribute code to these drivers. They test them. And this is kind of a backup material. Uh, we have a compliance, NVMe compliance, and we have the uh, PCSA and the UEFI flag test. So this is a redesigned NVMe Express website. So they did remove some of the links by mistake. Uh, I was told that they will be putting back uh, some of the back on this one. So these are the full links we have. So you can look up uh, this is later. So all this uh, material will be posted online. So you will have all this information even if we skip. So the agenda would be uh, platform format. Uh, I call it the platform format because I hate to call it the bias. But I'm adding bias there because most of the folks you know doesn't know what uh, it is basically. So I would call it the platform format because it covers everything. And then uh, device drivers, what type of device drivers we have. We have the uh, reference drivers, we have the uh, OEM specific uh, custom drivers that are part of the system that we buy. And then you have the uh, vendor specific uh, drivers that come as part of the option ROM. And I'll talk about how to get most of the, uh, most of the NVMe drivers. So UEFI ecosystem typically consists of the OEMs. Of course, they are the ones that are selling the hardware. So you have the server systems, you have the um, client systems, you have your iPhone, iPads. UEFI is everywhere. It's replaced the BIOS a while ago. It has just wide adaptation. And UEFI and UEFI drivers are very stable. So Intel engineers did an excellent job in uh, writing the original reference code for the UEFI. And then I did modify the UFI driver and basically I worked with all the OEMs and bias vendors and the OS vendors to, uh, not only the OS vendors, but uh, OEMs and bias vendors to have those bugs fixed. So they are available on the uh, NVM Express website. So this is the VFI website is here and then, uh, so this is how the uh, UFI driver comes into picture. You see the uh, pre verifier so you have the, uh, when you power on the system, right, in the system, so you do the security check. The security phase, then you have the CPU, uh, chipset and memory installation, you have the board installation. Then comes the next, uh, after the pre-FI installation, you have the driver execution environment, that's where the uh, drivers are loaded. So you pretty much your bias is done and all your uh, device recognition and then uh, based on what type of device the drivers are loaded by the bias. That's when the UEFI driver comes into picture. When you have a NVMe uh, SSD or NVMe uh, AIC card or internal card, whatever it is, the bias knows that say NVMe drive and it loads the uh, driver which is part of the platform firmware. Or if your uh, vendor gives the option RAM, it will be loaded from the option RAM. Then once it is loaded, then you have the uh, black IP protocol is installed on the drive, then you have the um, 
Good path is recognized, then good load is loaded, and the hardware system loads. So, PUFI pretty much covers everything from power on to the shutdown and end up like this. It's, it's not just only bias. That's why I don't like to call it as a bias there. So, as I said, I work with the OEMs, almost all the OEMs in uh, having the UFI um, generic support for all the NVMe devices. It's just not Intel or Samsung. Everybody, everybody's NVMe drive should be supported. I work with them very closely and uh, made sure that the uh, UFI drives work. Then uh, now most of the systems they automatically give us the NVMe drives and they can boot from them, just like a SATA drive. And there are reference drives, reference drivers, uh, which are useful for debugging. Especially if you want to bring up a NVMe SSD, you can enable the debugging the BIOS, you can enable the debugging your driver source code. You can practically see what's happening at both at the system uh, on my level at the uh, NVMe level. So that, that's where the different flavors come into picture. They're very useful. I did most of my debugging uh, uh, at the UEFI level and uh, we did find so many issues uh, you know, uh, without the already system present. And then uh, IHP drivers, the uh, your vendors, drive vendors give you the drives, custom drives uh, uh, to support the legacy systems that does not have UEFI. So all the systems with the half baked UEFI, most of the uh, systems with some BIOS vendors chose not to uh, adapt the latest UEFI. So they kind of you know uh, still some of the machines they still go with the older version of the UEFI. So for those, the option of basic UEFI drivers are useful. So there are standard disk tools available under UEFI. Uh, UEFI shell is mostly like a uh, operating system. You can do several things, except for the graphical user environment, you can do practically everything under UEFI shell. And it's very useful for bringing up the hardware, any hardware, not just me. So these are the uh, protocols, you can firmware update and driver health and all these things uh, they are useful. HII is the one that when you go to the BIOS setup, you see the menu screens, right? So those are the HII screens, basically human interface uh, infrastructure kind of thing. So in summary, you have provided an excellent environment for your debug. And uh, especially when you're bringing up your hardware, you have a driver very useful for that purpose. Because when, when you cannot boot operating system, you are not there at to boot an operating system. So if you search my name on Google, you will find uh, the presentations on the UFA NVMe drivers. Uh, the past presentation have a lot of details on you know what to do, all the commands and all the things are available on Google. So, so if you have any feedback, uh, let me know this is my email address. So we have a Windows reference driver uh, available. It's a uh, community driver, but I'm not going to cover this because of lack of time. So, next would be Mr. Deepavit. Uh, yep. <coughs> Mr. Pruitt is a principal program manager with uh, 25 years of experience in the storage industry, ranging from magneto optical to spinning the dust to flash. He's currently working for the Windows and Devices Group at Microsoft, where he is responsible for many of the components in the storage stack, including file systems, filter manager, containers, store port, and Microsoft's inbox, minibox, mini port drivers. He is responsible for storage devices ranging from SD and EMMC in mobile to NVMe in enterprise and data centers. He is also the Microsoft representative for the <coughs> to the NVMe port. So I would like to welcome. Yes, so, I'm going to switch up here. Uh, now, I'll talk about uh, the Microsoft Inbox driver uh, that we have across uh, many versions of Windows. And so, uh, originally, we introduced our Inbox NVMe driver storing NVMe.sys in Windows 8.1 and Server 2012 R2. But then it was aligned with the 1.0 C spec. Uh, because we saw such a great opportunity with NVMe, we actually at that point decided to backport it to Windows 7 and Server 28 or 2. So uh, you can see that basically right now that any of the supported operating systems of Microsoft have an inbox driver. Um, so it kind of just works, so to speak. Uh, 
um, and it is its core thinking part. So it's responsible down at the bottom of the storage stack for doing the translation because the Microsoft storage stack is a SCSI stack. Um, it is responsible for doing the translation from SCSI to NVMe. And as such, it follows the uh, SCSI to NVMe translation specification. So just a quick look at what does a storage stack kind of look like. You can think of a, all the way from the application app in the user space where we're talking about it just reads bytes and writes bytes to file handles. Um, we talk about file system, then doing the translation from bytes file to translate file offsets to bytes. And then, of course, down through the volume manager, translating finally into the storage stack where we actually have a SCSI command, CDB. And then finally, all the way down into the mini port where we translate it back again out into the NVMe NIST and across the, to the device. So, with that, uh, the inbox driver is actually fairly performant. Um, we get a, you can see from this graph, I think. Uh, so we talk about if we have one device, two device, three device, four device, you can see the IOPS scale that happens along the clouds. We do some problems if we have an application that's not NIMO aware. But if the application is NIMO aware, the storage stack is NIMO aware. And we get a very pretty good linear scaling between one, two, three, and four. So this was done on an Intel Brickman system with 60 cores. And you can see how, as we go, the scaling of this average CPU utilization is pretty linear. The megabytes per second is linear. The IOPS is linear. And the average latency is pretty flat. So pretty good scaling overall. Uh, another um, vector, uh, we have uh, one of our primary, uh, shall we say, say primary motivations in any of the drivers that we do is reliability, reliability, reliability. Um, and so with that, uh, our inbox driver is a highly reliable driver. From our telemetry, we see that it's a uh, crash rate, meaning machine crash rate is on the order of less than half a percent. Um, there, it's about uh, three times better than, I would say, vendor A, and a lot, lot better than vendor B. Um, so there are uh, very, um, variety of drivers out there with varying quality. And so that is something that needs to be taken into account when you're testing your systems and you're testing your device. And what does crash rate mean, percentage, per year, uh, per week? For a number of, number of unique machines we see crashing out there, what is their crash reason? Right. And so the crash reason being the story of the any driver, it's a very low reason potential. Good question. Also, uh, this is, uh, driver is now very power efficient. Um, people are wanting to use these things in all kinds of devices, not just enterprise. Um, so uh, we have very good battery life, laptops or other mobile devices. Uh, we have two sets. We have the operational power states. So the device can handle I.O., but it's been throttled. Um, that's through what we call logic form states or P states, if you're familiar with those within the Windows architecture. So the idea here is that um, if a device is needed, needs to be used, but we can't use it at its full performance envelope because of, say, thermal issues within the case, we can set it into a lower peak state and still get a decent performance out of it, but it stays cooler and doesn't burn somebody's knee or something like that. Uh, and then also we have very uh, aggressive non-operational power states, which we have to have a logical you know, states, what we call F states. So this will be things like connected standby type states, Present or user absent. So, uh, if you're familiar with the old S3, S4, this maps to a kind of a new S3 where the power is very low, but the resume time is also very low. So, the user then actually uses the storage and comes back through. And transitions of these states are determined by the overall power state. So, it's basically the whole holistic map of is the user using the device actively, or are they you know, screens off, if they're listening to music, or this thing has gotten into connected standby, and the user is not present in the device anymore. Um, and this can be tuned uh, or disabled depending on what you're um, trying to do with the device uh, via the inbox car content. So we have seen some OEMs that want to play with uh, different numbers with this, and so they will uh, take power config and tune the system to their specific device and how they put, the, put their system together. So, and some of the possible future directions that we're looking at for the driver. Um, obviously, we're very interested in the screening proposal. We've been actively working with uh, Samsung and others on that. Um, 
write type in RPMV for more mobile applications, uh, namespace management, and virtualization. So none of this is for I think yeah, they also have to say that because the lawyers make me. But uh, we would like to hear from people out there what do they want, what are the use cases that we're not supporting today that they want to. So as a call to action, I would love to try it out. Uh, see if you have issues, let us know what they are, uh, give us feedback, um, and there's my contact info if there's anything you'd like to talk about. And with that, I have a whole bunch of stuff in kind of penny slides if you can go through. Um, when you have a chance, uh, take a look at that. He said that uh, I wasn't supposed to display it because he killed me if I did. So, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. So our uh, next presenter is uh, Parag Maharana. He's a storage architect in Flash products business at Seagate. Parag has uh, 22 years of experience in product development and architecture of storage solutions. He's, uh, his expertise is in the new business products and uh, emerging technologies. So he was a product development and architect at various companies like LSI, AMI and Tata Galaxy. He has a master's degree in computer science and engineering from Yadavpur University and uh, he has uh, 14 approved credits. So I would welcome uh, Parag. Thank you. So I am very excited to present uh, the Linux fabric driver because this is done by so many people and so many companies and they have dedicated time the time the fabric driver is released and the spec release and the fabric driver open source is there is a time gap is very little. But still there are a lot of people get a lot of work in the community and dedicated time and to make this happen. So current uh, Linux fabric drives are based on the spec fabric spec 1.0 and the core spec 1.21. So we are planning to implement everything, all the mandatory features of the fabric driver. And we took the NME driver and we architect to make it uh, so that it follows the fabric models. There is a PCI transport and other fabric transport and feature transport, all things can work with the same driver. So we really architect and use almost 90% of the existing code and create a function template, what we call as the, uh, you can have different functionality within the uh, function. So for example, if you take the PCI fabric, PCI attached SSD and you do a read register, that doesn't mean anything in the fabric. So they will have to get embed method to make it happen. So that's what uh, I tried to explain here. And the fabric driver is now um, the Old NME Linux driver is divided into two sections. One is called host driver, another one is called fabric driver. So each of them has a different components. So there is a core component which is derived from the NME driver that applied to both uh, host driver and the target driver. Their commonality we use, we use. And uh, we are planning to release this fabric driver with the Linux kernel core. Yeah. Yeah, because the same driver runs on the question. little bit of a question. Okay. No, you, uh, you were going to ask. Okay. So, why the PCI driver, the host driver required for the PCI? Yeah, you can do the PCI. Yes, because the same PCI driver works for the fabric as well as the PCI. Okay, okay. so that's why. Yeah, exactly. host driver is meant to the local drive. Exactly. So that drive can be uh, coming from the external, from the any of the fabric, but it gives access to the uh, fields of the local SSD. So what are the driver uh, methodology to use? So initial the host and target driver developed for multiple enemy member companies and as I mentioned that there is a dedicated people, they put a lot of time to make this happen and all the NVMe, uh, initially it was part of the private repository 
with the exclusive NDA. Uh, but slowly, slowly, once the code is mature, then we started releasing the with the uh, infrared return of the SQL. Then, then we have the post driver source code, and everything is moved to uh, the infrared repository and multiple member activity working on those patches and it is already there. I have the reference as the patch of those in where you can download the code. And what are the things being implemented for the current fabric driver? It has the post driver has the fabric transport as a connection and disconnection for the multiple controllers. Means the this is something new for the host driver because now we are talking to a fabric oriented drive, so those things have to be connected. It is not locally available through the PCI innovation, so that has to be there. Then the transport uh, of the NVMe command and data generated by the NVMe port. That port is used by both the fabric and the fabric driver, and uh, it also required a discovery process. Uh, that we require to find out where the remote drives are available. And plus, we have two new features of, of, of the multipath and the keep alive. This is something like a watchdog primer in hardware, is a software based mechanism where you can keep on checking whether your drive is alive or the connection is, is broken or something. And back to the NVMe target driver. The mandatory NVMe, uh, all the features are mandatory features of the NVMe and fabric commands are implemented. And uh, we are supporting multi post subsystem control based all the things we are supporting. And uh, discovery also is there in the target size and the target configuration information is also included. So, coming back to the how the fabric driver. Uh, differentiate on the regular driver. So the I have included a slide at the backup section, maybe you can see later. But the basically the when the NVMe PCI drivers comes, it allocates the uh, submission queue and completion queue in the post queue. But when you come to the fabric model, the submission queue is not in the PCI memory of the initiator. It is in the fabric side. So the command packet have to be built and send RDM and send to the other side. So other side, the target receives as the RDM field and it actually put into the submission queue of the system. And uh, from the target side, then it, based on the read request or write request, it can do a RDM read or RDM write to the post box. Then finally, when the command is completed, it in by completion to the in host queue and they will send you RDMSN. So this is not the same mechanism what we used to do with the PCI browser mechanism. It is more global, more interoperable. So the host driver's implementation it depend on the generate interop by the RDM event or anything that is the, if there is a proprietary And this is the core of the model of the post uh, driver and the uh, target driver. And uh, the core is consists of the NVMe commands and the NVMe admin commands and IO commands and the NVMe and fabric command data structures. That is shared between the both the PCI and fabric driver. So the it is also so those drivers are previously all these drivers are uh, So, the, all these drivers are part of the NVMe driver. Now they can restructure and form in individual modules, and those modules being uh, clearly defined in the new planet drivers for source structures. And this is a common driver. You can load a driver, and it will say the NVMe core. This is the core driver, and this is the PCI driver. So, then we'll come back to the overall architecture of the NVMe uh, host driver. 
So it depends on the this implemented the block MQ interface, and you can have the same NUMA based or processor based architecture, Q based mechanism, and you can do everything from the way you used to get local SSD versus a fabric based SSD. If the mechanism is from block player above, everything looks similar. There is no difference, but below this, it goes to the PCI transport or the RDMA transport. That's where the differentiation comes from the outside from application point of view. You just need to know that there is a SSD available local or Next, the this is the target driver architecture where you can implement the IOS are coming to the target and uh, target process and there is a Linux company FS usually being integrated to the configuration of the target driver that can be used and the uh, RDM fabric. Also the common uh, driver they implemented a loop back driver just to validate if you don't have a uh, fabric driver available or device available you can still test with the loop back driver. So what are the next steps Linux driver is doing? Now the we are almost done with the implementation of the all the mandatory features of the Linux fabric driver and we are trying to do the fiber channel driver that will be planned to do on the kernel 4.9 uh, plus we are planning to do the authentication feature and controller memory buffer and automated post multipath and different type of lock pages supposed to not be bring into the driver. So this will be uh, done post a 4.8 release uh, but we are trying to right now trying to stabilize the driver and we are working on the people to bring come back and say that uh, is there an issue or anything like that. We are requesting people to download the driver and try out if you think something is missing or something required enhancement or any feature thing, please let us know and we will be happy to accommodate you. And here is some um, links. You can download the specification and you can download the fabric driver resources. And plus, this GitHub is already public on the Zoom. You can download the driver. And if you have any Posting anything you can send email to this. This was committed on the original other and the machine and the update that may be supported previously. So I would like to welcome uh, Jim. Thanks, Jim. I'm first going to talk about the storage performance development kit. This is a little bit different than what most of the talks you've heard so far today. Uh, this is really geared towards uh, storage appliances and applications which are dedicated for storage. Cases where you're going to take an NVMe device is going to be single purpose. Um, and in a lot of these cases, uh, what we've seen on the network side for a long time and now with storage as well is there's a lot of cases where these applications and appliances will uh, avoid a lot of the overhead you might get in general purpose operating systems and actually do the work in user space and pull them to get much better efficiency. And I'll go through some performance data that shows that in some more detail. Uh, this does leverage the data plane development kit. Uh, this is another open source project that uh, is used very widely in the networking space for uh, data packet processing, network packet processing. Uh, this is really designed, um, you know, currently we see huge efficiencies on NAND, but it's especially designed for some of the next generation uh, NVMe media like 3D Crosspoint. It is PSD licensed, so you can use it as reference code, porting, etc. without any sort of license restrictions, and you can get access to it uh, via GitHub or our project website, spdk.io. 
So this just shows uh, the building blocks that we've released so far as part of SBDK. I'm just going to talk about this NVMe SSD driver down here. Um, but this is really something that we're designing as a, as a framework for building more sophisticated uh, target applications and user space to be able to take advantage of some of these next generation media legacies. So the NVMe driver features, it is uh, 1.2 spec compliant. Uh, it runs in an asynchronous whole mode operation. Um, again, I'll go into some more details on why this is important. We, we were able to, to eliminate a lot of the software overhead that you get with uh, typical interrupt driven operation. Uh, there's a number of operate optional features that are implemented in driver, for example, uh, weighted round robin, uh, controller memory buffer, end to end data protection. Uh, reservations for dual port uh, operation and also um, scatter gather list. So this just goes talks a little bit about the driver throughput scalability. Is our magic uh, laser pointer here? Okay, so. You know, we've talked a lot about how these NVMe Express SSDs, they can get a half million IOs per second. Um, and, you know, now that we see that we're going to start seeing systems that are going to have multiple SSDs in one platform, you may have appliances that have even more than that. Uh, typically, we see with the, the Linux kernel driver that the, the scales pretty well. You can get about a half million IOs per second per core. Um, but what we've done on with, with this chart here is we've actually restricted operations just using a single Intel Xeon core and seeing how, how far can we how far can we ramp this. So with the Linux kernel, we're sort of maxed out here around 500,000 IOs per second. But with the with the SPDK driver, because we're eliminating the interrupt overhead, uh, eliminating a lot of the other more generic uh, block level features um, that you would get in a general purpose driver uh, operating system. Uh, we can scale this where we can max out um, eight Intel P3700 SSDs with a single core. Uh, so again, this isn't real, we're not pushing this as like this replaces the Linux kernel NVMe driver or the Linux kernel NVMe driver is bad. This is just a, uh, this is just really a solution for those cases where you do have a dedicated storage appliance or application. So next I'm gonna touch on uh, FreeBSD. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with FreeBSD, it is a, a rather, um, it, it, it's actually rather well used with uh, a lot of appliance vendors. Um, Netflix actually uses FreeBSD on a lot of their cache appliances. Netflix is a pretty big contributor to the FreeBSD project. Um, so just wanted to touch briefly on uh, the FreeBSD drivers. Uma had mentioned in the past that we hadn't had this um, talk here, so I just wanted to touch a little bit about that this year. So in FreeBSD, you have, uh, it's a full distribution. It's not like Linux where you have a Linux kernel and then you have you know, different distributions. FreeBSD is a whole project. And so as part of that, we have, we have the drivers here. We have the core NVMe driver, um, which traditionally up until just the last few months is, is exposed through the generic uh, GM block layer. Netflix has recently added support to surface NVMe through uh, CAM, which makes it sort of on par with the SCSI and ATA uh, functionalities in FreeBSD today. Then it also provides this NVMe control utility similar to like NVMe CLI on Linux to do some of those more management type um, operations. It's a little bit of, of overview. Support was added uh, to FreeBSD in 2012. Um, currently it's 1.0e spec compliant. Uh, the primary contributors are Intel. Uh, Netflix is also a big contributor on this. Um, and then I, I, I briefly went through these, uh, uh, these modules already here. Um, so in summary, um, you know, especially at the SPDK point, if, if that's something that's of interest to you, uh, please download the source code. We have some example apps and all the world applications. Um, you know, definitely take the tires on that and provide feedback. And same thing for FreeBSD, if this is something that's of interest to you, um, please take a look and, and provide details of what you'd like to see more of. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. So our next
next uh, presenter would be Sudanshu uh, Sars Jain. So, uh, Sars is leads uh, VSP and product management to drive network and storage in the current solutions at VMware. He is also responsible for VSPS uh, virtual devices and virtual platform. So, prior to VMware, he was a director of product management at Alpha Tech Recent, where he was leading the distributed data center fabric solution to Jeff Space. So, I would like to welcome Sars. Thanks, Omar. So we are saving the best for the last two. Great. Okay. So from VMware, from VMware perspective, I think uh, flash and MME is a big focus area. Uh, there are many use cases in, in, inside the VMware platform where we are trying to leverage uh, different flash technology, different MME and VM we can we are going in that direction. So we make a lot of investment in that area. But before we go into that area, I think let me give you a glimpse of where what the thought process was in the, inside the VMware to march or towards the, the journey where then we are getting new and newer, newer technologies, uh, and, uh, as well as uh, both on the networking side and the storage side, and also VMware's ambition to uh, virtualize complete uh, data center uh, infrastructure itself. So we started working with uh, many of the IO vendors dynamically uh, for the last couple of years. And we have been working with them, and thanks to them, uh, we have introduced uh, we have introduced our technology uh, for the new uh, sets of driver. Uh, what we have to uh, introduce. So what we had before was sort of a, a, a legacy architecture, uh, depending on the VMK Linux infrastructure, uh, which has been quite popular for the last ten years or so. But we introduced totally brand new ways of APIs in the, uh, our kernel itself, and that's where we start building our infrastructure. So last two couple of years, we have invested quite uh, extensively in this area, and that's where we are trying to introduce MME, RDMA, and MME fabric, and a lot of newer tech set of technology, 100 gigs, and all that stuff coming up, all the good stuff is coming up in this area. So that's where the, our focus is, and moving forward, we want to make sure that uh, most of the new features are coming up in this architecture itself. And from that point of view, uh, basically, this is what the core architecture is from the VCF uh, point of view. So, if you see, uh, we have a MME driver which uh, been out there for about uh, one release now. We are uh, working uh, to extend that further into the, uh, you know, going towards MME 1.2. Uh, we are also working in the uh, fabric space uh, quite uh, closely with uh, many of the custom partners, and we'll continue to invest in that area. Also, uh, we are introducing RDMA uh, as part of this architecture. Uh, also, we are doing it uh, something, uh, I would say, with the industry's first a virtualized MVV uh, device. So, it's a completely virtualized MVV device. Uh, currently, it's a uh, spec to 1.0e spec of MVV. So, any MVV driver you have from any standard Windows or Linux should be able to work on top of it. And we have done some in initial studies on performance, and it's a lot more uh, performant than uh, what you get from PV specific driver or in another side driver. So that's the area where we want to continue investing. Uh, today, uh, our stack today is uh, SCSI stack. What we want to get uh, eventually is uh, get end to end and maybe stack. And that's another area of focus where we are investing in it as well. So that's the uh, area where we are. Uh, Continue to invest, and we are trying to bring this uh, data stores, lands uh, on uh, across the board, multiple uh, uh, you know, of, uh, abstract technology that we support, whether it's the virtual scan, which VMFS, or virtual volume, they will all be supporting MME based uh, data stores as well as MME over fabric data stores. So, as far as the journey goes, uh, basically, if you look at it, uh, we started in Pilot 5. We introduced a async driver. Not, it was not in box. Uh, we enhanced that and introduced the first inbox driver in 6.0. It was uh, basically back to about uh, 1.0e. And we are trying to enhance that further in the coming release and trying to introduce many new features. And we are looking for inputs and feedback from the community. What you would like to see? I know that uh, multiple queues, streams, uh, namespaces, everything is uh, which 
is up for discussion here, and we are working on it. Same on the fabric side. Uh, there are many talks about what all we need to do in the fabric side. Uh, we are trying to work with our RDB community as well as in the fiber channel community to bring a new fabric in the multiple uh, flavors going forward. Uh, at a very high level, these are the places uh, where you can get more information. Uh, we have our driver, we are also open sourcing our driver. Uh, it's available on uh, GitHub now. I think there should be some pointer, yes, that's a pointer. Um, what we want to do is, we are making it under uh, BSD license. So if you want to innovate as a partner company and try to bring your own uh, innovation back to the uh, VMware, uh, we are open for that. And actually you can bring it your innovation and make it your own exclusive. So we are making the open, uh, the whole system open for the uh, for your um, your innovation to come and be part of the VMware community and supported by VMware officially. So that's uh, another powerful point that we are trying to invest in as well. Um, so that's pretty much it from my point of view. And thank you. Thank you sir. So we didn't expect that we will have so much time. So <laughs> We have a lot of time for questions and answers. Yes, Mr. Hamdi. Yes, very good. Slide 46, you uh, said that you're using RDMA send and receive to update the submission queue. Well, yes. why are you using untagged buffers instead of tag buffers? Can it tag? It seemed to me uh, to use uh, for the submission queue, you would, you would want to use uh, tagged buffers, which would mean that you would be using the RDMA read and write instead of the send and receive. No, RDMA uh, send and receive used for the NVMe command packet or capsule. command capsule, but the data is done through the RDMA read or RDMA So it's write. a capsule. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. So any other questions? There's a question here. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a question for Lee. Um, generally, when I've heard of NVMe and SCSI, a lot of times they're being positioned as sort of competitor technologies, but you've integrated NVMe into a SCSI stack and set like VMware. That was a starting point. And I'm just wondering what, if anything, you feel you've left on the table by bringing NVMe under the SCSI stack? Or, or Good question. Come so up? what have we left? Yeah, just saying. So, uh, um, from the fact that we have a SCSI stack and then at the bottom we're translating back into NDME, do we feel that we've left anything on the table? Um, to a little bit. Uh, frankly, at this point, uh, we're, if, at the point, if you looked at the uh, diagram I gave, at the point where we actually translate into SCSI at the disk layer, to the point where we're actually sending the command on the NDME, is about five microseconds of latency in the stack right now. We've done a lot to bring it down to a very small level. So currently, as with the devices in you know 80 microseconds that have done a really good device, we're not so bad on the overhead. Next generation from our friends here, we go to single dex, single digit microsecond latencies on the MVME device. Then yes, we start to have a problem. But that being said, my portion of the stack is that five microseconds, and then my uh, colleagues in the file system have a much higher overhead than I do. So <laughs> I'll, make, I'll make them go first. I think uh, just to add to it, uh, basically, of course, you can integrate the NVMe uh, inside the SCSI stack, and that's what everybody does initially. But there's a lot of value to use NVMe stack end to end. Especially when we are looking at it from virtualization perspective, and there's a you know uh, there's a multiple stacks involved here, uh, especially from guest operating system all the way to the drive. Um, we want to make sure that we are able to take advantage of these stacks, and that's why one of the reasons we are trying to reduce the virtual device so that at least in the guest operating system you can run the NVMe stack to start with itself.
Yeah, good question. So, were there any kinds of commands that we didn't have a good translation mechanism for? And the answer is no. Um, mostly because there is a very, uh, there's a, shall we say, small set of actual SCSI commands that we ever generate within Windows itself um, on the order of, I believe, 18 commands. And they're all very well uh, represented in the translation document. Question for Lee. You showed a slide that showed the performance uh, Windows. Yeah, good question. Um, actually, frankly, I don't know on that one because I got that slide from a colleague. <laughs> um, but I believe it was we usually what we do is we query the device and we look at the number of cores and then we spread things around um, with NUMA in mind. So we do it within a NUMA group and put out on each core a submission and completion queue uh, per core up to the number that the device supports. So if you have that five microseconds. Yes, at some point, obviously, you know, the overhead gets to the point where we're, you, know, you don't get any workload done. I, I haven't done all the calculations on that yet, and I can just say it's, it's, it's really um, more like in the file system and in the application layer where the, most of that stuff gets, we waste a lot of time, so to speak. But, um, yeah. Someday we're going to probably have to change the IO model, but we're not quite there yet. Okay, so thank you. Yes, could you, any of you, uh, probably Lee, uh, give uh, some example use cases for multiple namespaces? Uh, uh, so, asking about use cases for multiple namespaces. Yes. Um, frankly, I don't really have any. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so people generally asking for the multiple namespaces, they want to do different things from the different namespaces. For example, they want to do it from the okay. So, so basically, people are asking for multiple namespaces and different purpose. So someone went around to the II ops and things like that, 4K block size. Someone wants to just boot a legacy uh, block, 512 block size. They may want to have two different namespaces. So this kind of thing, use cases are available today. And if there are different applications, they want to dedicate a namespace for application. Another use case comes out from the virtualization perspective. When you have multiple guest shopping systems and you want to manage it differently and different priority, uh, that's another idea. Yeah, I think from our point of view as well, is namespaces really become uh, necessary when you're doing virtualization and you've got SRIB and you're giving chunks of the namespaces to a uh, VM. Yeah, that's the kind of answer.